Father in heaven, uh, first and foremost, Lord, we want to thank you for loving us. Uh, we want to thank you, Lord Jesus, that your love and your care, your grace is always extended towards us. Lord, that we would open our hearts to receive from you. That we would, Lord, not be that stiff-necked, stubborn type person, but rather open our hearts to the love of God, to the life that you have for us. As we, Lord, partake of your word tonight, I pray, Lord, that something wonderful would take place in our hearts, our minds, and souls, that we come to a better understanding of who the Holy Spirit is in our lives. For it's in your name, Lord. Amen and amen. amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, God is good to us. We're embarking tonight on a new category. If you remember right, the person, the presence, and the power of the Holy Spirit. Remember those? What, three years ago? Uh, when we started, the, the, the person, the presence, and the power is where we began of the Holy Spirit. The person of the Holy Spirit, the presence of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit. We moved into the, the character of the Holy Spirit, the conduct of the Holy Spirit, and the concerns of the Holy Spirit. Which when you think of trying to capture, remember, the, the character and the conduct of God, uh, it was quite a task. And remember we had that long list of the conduct capturing who he is, not all encompassing, but to gain an idea of who he, is, who he is in our lives and in this world. And now we went into the gifts of the Holy Spirit, dealing with Christ's gifts to the church, the Holy Spirit's gifts, and spiritual gifts. But we ended there last month, and believe it or not, we are now going into the governance of the Holy Spirit, the governance. So, let's begin. The governance, when you first think of governance, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Governance. Government, law, authority, anybody else? One more. <laughs> Has anybody got anything? Judgment. Judgment. When you're dealing with the governance of the Holy Spirit, we're dealing with an issue that every person in this room, let's expand that, every person in this room and their respective family and friends, let's expand that, every person on the face of the earth of all time, from beginning the first person to the last person, governance is dealing with the thing that you and I and everyone ever born of the womb has had to deal with. Control. Control. The Holy Spirit is the, is the one who governs all things. Now when you think of uh, anybody who understands vehicles of any kind, sometimes they used to put on trucks or certain vehicles, do you remember they used to put something in order to make sure that you didn't go too fast? What was that called? Governor. What is it? Governor. A governor. To right, to, to control. To what? To control that in order to make sure it didn't go beyond or too fast or so that it would prevent what? What was it trying to prevent? Was it just trying to make sure that the, the driver, what was it trying to do? Uh, to, to make sure that it didn't, go, it didn't go faster than it was supposed to, which would create either breaking the law or damage to the vehicle, right? So it had a governor, a control, uh, something to manage it. That's what governance is all about. It deals with control issues. The most of the problems that we deal with, personally, problems in the church, problems in society, problems in families, problems everywhere deal with control. Control. More church splits happen because of control than any other thing. Control. More families split over control than anything else. We say it's finances, finances, but in actuality it's control, control of the finances. <laughs> it's control. That's really what it comes down to. Even when you're dealing with a deviant behavior, a very deviant behavior of someone who is uh, off uh, committing uh, immoral, immoral acts in such a way that is uh, horrible and deviant, it's not the act that is actually pleasing them. What are they actually trying to do? Control. Dealing with control issues. Everything comes down to uh, control issues. As a matter of fact, 
in many people's lives that deal with depression, what are they oftentimes actually dealing with is control. They're trying to control. They can't control what's around them or they're trying to control what's around them. And if you've noticed that you and I can barely control what's inside this skin, never mind what's outside the skin. But when you're dealing with governance, we must understand that we're dealing with controlling issues. Many people have made altar calls, have come to the Lord, have called upon the Lord because of that great issue. Some have come looking at the symptoms. I deal with, I deal with, when in actuality, if you take that tree down, the root of it is I've got control issues. I'm trying to control life around me. I'm trying to control the world. I'm all bothered with. And everything's irritating me because, and it comes down to, is that I want my hands on everything. And I want it to all go according to my way. My way. Control is not just making sure you're, but it's trying to get it all my way or the way that I should see it, the way I see it. I want it to happen. You should do this in your family. This is what I'm seeing and this is what you should do. And now I'm going to step in and control that you need to, you need to stop, you need to, and we're trying to control. And how many, the, oftentimes that is called, and even in the Bible it's called, busy body. <laughs> Going into a realm that you have no part of and trying to control what are in-laws noted for. <laughs> right? In-laws are very well noted for stepping out of where they belong and into your sphere. And what are they there for? To control and to manage the way that they think you should be running your life. That's what oftentimes in-laws are noted for. And, but it's true with anyone, everyone. Uh, you probably have seen it even in your workplace. Whereas you are at one desk doing a certain job and there could be somebody in a totally different department who wants to make sure that you are doing your job properly, what are they going to do? Come into, and even though it's not within their realm or their sphere or their responsibility, they have this desire to what? Control. It's an issue that many, many people deal with. Everything, now here's everything of life, everything of life revolves around control. Control. Everything. You start looking around, life all around you is dealing with always control. Controlling people, controlling situations. Even you look at the political system that we are involved with, not just here in America, but all through the world. What are we oftentimes dealing with? Control issues, governing issues. The rise and fall of, of people who lead countries are dealing with who's going to run the country, who's going to control the country. Dictatorships come. A variety of people arise. Various Various immoral acts are committed. All kinds of things are done, all in this control issues. Uh, daughters try to control moms. Moms try to control daughter-in-laws. Daughter-in-laws try to control husbands. Husbands try to, it just goes on and on and on and all trying to make it uh, uh, come into and submit to the way, the standards that we see. So in this, we find a variety of this the word called rights. Many people deal with what they deem as their rights. Matter of fact, our own American Civil War dealt with state rights versus federal. In that, I want my rights. We have individual rights. We have personal rights, state rights, federal rights, um, personal rights of home and family. This is uh, employer's rights, worker's rights. You have a right too. And when somebody knows that they have a right, what's the thing that they want to do? Exercise those rights. Is that not so? And everything must abide by and yield to, everything must abide by and yield to their rights. Even high school students today, they have rights. And they're quick to exercise. You in your home have probably established a certain order in your home, hopefully a certain order in your home. But once those kids find out where those rights are, where are they going to live? In those rights, and what will they constantly be doing every day? What's that? Exercising those rights, but even more so, testing those rights to find out if they can be expanded. It's a control issue. I want to take over. 
And you'll notice that this isn't something that you develop or learn from. You're born with it. Every person's born with it. I'm amazed already at my little granddaughter, Olivia, how much she wants to control life around it. And that's what, we're, that's what they're doing even as, as babes. And as high school students, they get even worse. And when they hit college age, living at home, my goodness. It's all of a sudden, all of life has to. But you know, it doesn't stop there. As you get older, it doesn't get less, it gets worse. Haven't you ever seen the grumpy old man? No, it's the old grumpy old woman who's... <laughs> <laughs> coming to the checkout line and demanding, I'm a senior citizen. <laughs> Therefore, I want my rights. You should be, because we even have unexpressed rights. You can't even, walk, you can't even drive through Concord's downtown Main Street without coming across someone at some time who's going to be exercising their pedestrian <laughs> rights. True? The ones especially who are going to walk and not even look. Right? Because you had better stop. Because the rights. Have you noticed those blue handicap signs? My wife, she knows. I, <laughs> I see those people driving up into the blue handicap signs with it all handy up. I said, oh, another one with a hangnail. Because today, everyone's looking for, how many? That thing's abused today. That thing's abused. It's no longer, I've seen the most healthiest people come waltzing out of their cars going into, but they've got that blue sticker. It doesn't matter if they're disabled or not. They've got that blue little thing to tell them what? They got the right. They got the right to park there. So, we're dealing with today with rights, and rights to all deal with control. All deal with governance. All deal with, with uh, uh, the way that we want things to be. Now when we're dealing with the governance, think of it, the governance of the Holy Spirit. He's God Almighty. The Spirit of the living God. God Almighty. His governing. He doesn't have governing issues like you and I do. We have control issues. He knows he's in control. You know, he's not like trying to figure it out. Or how much can I go? Or gee, you know, uh, I, I don't want to go too far with, with Gary. He, you know, he gets, he gets tender. You know, he, he, he might get offended. Yeah, right. Like, God's concerned with that. Now, oftentimes, people have tried to portray him as, well, he's a gentleman, and he'll never come across your will. Thank God he stepped across my will. Because I would have kept him at bay till the day I died. Thank God he rushed in and ushered in who he was. In this, we must recognize that he doesn't have control issues because he is in control of all things. Jesus himself said, not even a sparrow falls to the ground without his knowledge. So, where do we begin? The first place to begin really is the fall of man. The fall of man. Now, many of you should be, hopefully are, familiar with the fall of man and the issues what was the issue that was involved with? When you're dealing with the fall of mankind, Adam and Eve falling, falling from their grace with God, their estate with God, falling from, falling from their relationship with the Lord, falling from perfection, from innocence, from goodness. When they fell, uh, what was the main issue? What was the main issue? Disobedience. They disobeyed. But when you look at it a little deeper, you realize it was really an authority issue. It was an authority issue. They chose to believe. Adam chose to believe one's word over another. He actually exercised his authority and gave his authority to another. He was set as the apex of humanity. There was none like him. All authority had been given to him. All of the creation was in submission and dominion to him. And when Satan came and worked his wiles through the serpent, through the woman, in order to get to Adam. Adam was the one he was after. Because all dominion had been given to Adam. And in Adam rested the seed of humanity, not in Eve. He was after Adam. But in this he came through the weakest of circles. He came through first the, the creation, the serpent. Then through a weaker vessel, the one that was created from Adam, the woman, in order to speak and to get to Adam. 
in this, it was an authority issue he was after to gain dominion over the creation. Gaining dominion over the entire creation was his goal. Gain dominion over all of mankind that was housed in the loins of Adam. All of creation. So therefore, when all of authority was given to Adam, he said, every herb of the field, everything's for food for you. I want you to go uh, to till the garden. I want you to, everything, everything's under your control. But he then, in the fall, gave his authority to another, yielded to his senses. They saw that the apple was good. If I say an apple, the fruit. It's been portrayed as an apple for so long today that we just say apple. But the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil but it was actually an authority issue. He disobeyed God's word, willful disobedience, but in actuality it was an authority issue, past authority in order, so Satan now has authority over all the creation. Does that make sense? It was authority, and now that's where we have been and following his agenda and subject to his agenda ever since. All of humanity is subject to the authority and the dominion and the rulership of the enemy. Satan, the devil, the deceiver. How do we know that it's true? Just look around you. You can go to the most backwards area of the most remote area of the third world and you will find people that are showing the, the devil's presence. That he's everywhere. Do you remember what it says? In 1 John chapter 5, verse 19, where it says the whole world is under the sway, under the influence of the devil. So it's an authority issue. And today, all of humanity, every person ever born of the womb, think of it, that nice little baby that's just born, Joellen or, or Reed Marshall, born you got this cute little baby, so, so innocent, hasn't done one thing wrong, has already been born under the dominion of the enemy. Under the influence and the sway, born into a world that is already subject to and will be led by and dictated to by its senses. What it sees, what it hears, what it gets comfortable to, what it gets accustomed to. Have that, Joel, have that baby uh, on your lap uh, from the hours of one and four every morning, just being comforted and, and, and just fed and just warmed. And, and then all of a sudden on the fifth, sixth night, just put it in the crib and leave it alone. Say, well, just deal with it. That baby will cry. And the cry is actually a demand to get back to what it was accustomed to, back what it wants, to get what it wants. All of the world is under. We are all of humanity and all of creation has been passed under the authority of this, of this uh, being, this entity, this essence of perfect hatred. Perfect hatred. A killing machine. The serial killer of all serial killers. One who kills, lies, destroys. Perfect perfect machine, perfect entity of wickedness. Everything that is ungodly, everything that is untrue, everything that is unpure and impure is him. And all of humanity has been passed under him. Think of, the, of what you and I and all of the world is up against. This is that being, that all of, so you, and you see it being played out in everyone's life. They get that, that uh, scornful look, that despiser of God. That despiser of God is actually the sway and influence of the enemy in their lives, giving that nasty eye towards the Lord. I don't want that truth. I don't want that good news. I don't want that, I don't want anything to do with you because you have passed a death sentence to me. But in this, they refuse to look at the hope because the hope means death to self, submitting to the death penalty to receive. The death penalty has been given. It's submitting to the death penalty. In, you will, shall surely die. Submitting to the Lord's death penalty that you might receive the Savior. Dying to one frees you to live the other. 
just as the law states that a man cannot remarry while a spouse is still living. But once a death takes place, you are now free to marry another. By the same way, we dying to self frees us from the law of sin and death and frees us now to marry another, Christ Jesus our Lord. Does that make sense? So we are actually denying ourselves, denying the authority, denying a right to ourselves, denying, and instead submitting to the authority of a new one, another one. Does that make sense? Which was gained in Luke 4.6. If you would look at Luke 4.6. Many of you are familiar with this section of scripture. Luke chapter 4, when the devil, who, remember, as we just talked about, all of under his sway, all is under his sway. We just addressed how it got there. Authority is the issue. Who do you obey? All of the world, remember now, the unbelievers, all unbelievers, all natural man, all of creation obeys the authority, the dominion, the power of the wicked one. 1 John chapter 5, verse 19. Now here in Luke chapter 4, verse 6, the new Adam comes forth. The Bible calls Jesus in the New Testament the new Adam or the second Adam, the new man. Everyone born of the womb came forth from the loins of natural Adam, first Adam. But the new creation, remember we talked about God Almighty is the creator. We oftentimes look at it as past tense. Rather, we need to look at that he is the creator of new as well. He's still in the process of creating. That's why he says you're a new creation in Christ. The old is past, the new has come. The old earth and old heavens will pass away. Behold, all things are new coming. In this, this new Adam, this new Adam, Jesus, the new man, is coming to bring forth life. And in this, he is tested. In Luke chapter 4, verse 6, And the devil said to him, notice an, an outright attack, an assault. And the devil said to him, all this, authority, all this authority I will give you and their glory. Stop. What's he going to give the Lord? All authority. I will, he, it is his to give. And Jesus is not going to deny that it's his to give. He can give it to whomever he wishes. So in this it says, then the devil take, uh, And the devil said to him, All this authority I will give you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. Thing to note here is that where did, where did the devil, where did Satan get all this authority? Notice it says, it has been delivered to me. Meaning it's not in himself. He doesn't have authority in himself. It's been granted to him by the one who has all authority. He gained legal right to it by causing the first Adam, Adam, to succumb. He gained it a legal right over all things. Our courtrooms and our legal system and our judgments and our statutes that you see in all the world merely reflect really the, the, the kingdom of God in that there is a judgment. There are laws. There are statutes. There are right and wrong. There is punishment. We didn't devise this on our own. And here we have an, an onslaught taking place where the devil is coming directly against Jesus and offering him what? What's he want? He wants to taint him with authority. That in this body that has been prepared for the Lord, just as Adam had a body, Jesus had a body, but Jesus is God. He's not created by God. He's begotten because he is God. And in this, he is being tested. Will you succumb? Will you yield? Will you give? Will you come under the authority of the devil? And in this... Worship me. Just worship me. Therefore, if you worship before me, all will be yours. 
And Jesus, verse 8, And Jesus answered and said to him, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only will you serve. Now, what's a key word in verse 8? For it is written, You shall what? What's, he, what's, what's, what's the Lord say? It is written, You shall what? You shall worship the Lord. What did Satan offer him? Authority. Therefore, if you put those together, when somebody's worshiping the Lord, what's the foundational thing that's called for? Putting those two words together. Authority and worship. What is, now, hopefully you're following along with me here. What was offered to him? Authority. Jesus now responds with the word of God, and the word of God holds this word worship. Therefore, worship involves what? Subject to. Worship involves, therefore, who you're submitting to. Who, are you, who is your authority? Does this make any sense? That you cannot worship the Lord. There is no worship of the Lord unless there is submission to his authority. Whoever and whatever we are esteeming as the authority in our life is really what we're what's worshiping. Whatever a person is authorizing in their life as their rule in their life, that's what we're worshiping. And you'll notice sometimes these oppose each other. Certain authorities in your life may oppose each other. Now it's calling for what? If two authorities are coming into your life, two things that you uphold as authorita authoritative in your life, but they're contrary, calling for two different paths, the one that you choose is, is what your God you're going to listen to. You just re gave regard for beyond the other. So let's put it in a, uh, in a more of a natural setting so that we understand better. You have parents who come to the child and say that, this is not the kind of people we are. This is the life you're going to lead. This is what we do. The friends over here are saying, no, don't listen to. We're going to. If the friends and the parents are saying the same thing, all is well and there's harmony. True? If the pastor, the parents, and the friends are all saying the same thing, and the child has regard for all three as authority in their life, perfect harmony, all is well with my life, I love my life. Because they're all doing and I'm going to abide by. But when all of a sudden friends who they give great regard to and parents who they give regard to oppose each other. No, you're not going to go to whatever. No, you're not going to hang out with or no, you're not going to at 10 o'clock go down and hang out at the four corners. No, you're. But they're opposing. Well, friends, we're all going. Well, parents, no, you're not going to go. Decision time. Right? who they actually uphold and esteem as the true authority in their life, will be the one that's going to get the answer. Whatever is said yes to, whatever yes is said to, now they may not, the child may not end up going because of fear of retribution, but they'll show their disdain with contempt, disdain, scowling looks, not listening, throwing temper tantrums, whatever, showing that they're actually choosing the other way. They reject your authority over their life. So who do they worship? They're actually worshiping the influence of the friends over the parents. This happens with the Lord all the time. That the Lord, your, your God Almighty, you reign in my life. Lord, reign in me over all the earth. Right? We sing it and stuff. But then all of a sudden it comes through decision time through the course of the day now, who are you going to serve? Who we serve, who we submit to, declaring who the authority is in our life or what the authority is in our life determines really what you worship. Now, you may say or someone may say, well, I'm not going down and bowing to idols. How many times have we seen even on Sundays where a person, I know I should be in church, but I'm going instead to... Even though the Lord is, I know, but I'm going. So they have something else that is more authoritative and more desirous in their life. That's what they worship. Because notice that the Lord is the one who says, 
You shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. The whole idea of worship, he was tempted with what? Authority. Choose this authority over that. You cannot get away from worship the Lord. You cannot get away from authority. No place in all this earth will anybody ever get away from the fact that there's authority in place in this earth. No one can get away from it. It's everywhere. You can go anywhere with any tribe, with any people, any nation, go anywhere at all times, you'll always find somebody's in charge. Somebody calls the shots. Somebody has the title. Somebody is looked to. Someone is calling for obedience, and if you don't obey, there's always the head chief somewhere. Every Indian tribe has a chief. Even in friends, when you come across with a pack of friends, somebody is in charge. Somebody's the alpha. Somebody is the one that's influencing. That's going to move everybody, the whole other tribe, going this way or that way. You cannot, we cannot get away from authority. The devil tempts Jesus with authority. Jesus responds with, I'm not going to worship you. I'm going to worship the Lord. Meaning, I'm not going to submit to and desire your authority. But instead, I'm going to have my, I'm going to stay in submission to the authority of God. Does that make sense? Absolutely essential to understand. Turn, if you would, to the next gospel, chapter 14, 28. John 14, 28. John chapter 14, verse 28, Jesus says to the disciples, You have heard me say to you, I am going away and coming back to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice because I said, I am going to the Father, for my Father is greater than I. I need to address this in that, that this is not, this is not in that he's greater in the sense of a, of a greater being. This has to do with authority is that the, that the words of the Father, the promise of a Father, that this has to do all with position, not in power. This has to do with position, not power. Just as the Son is a position, not as someone who's lesser than. Such as we can look and say, well, uh, my son's Adam and my son Stephen have stemmed from my loins, so they come after me as though they're less than me. But in the things of the spirit world, the son means it's a position. It's a position issue. The son has been portrayed that this is the son. These are the sons of Gary Cody, and the oldest son is Adam. That's his position. Therefore, in, in, in history, you'll find that when inheritance when in biblical history, when inheritance is being given, it's being distributed, who is the first one all goes to? The eldest. It has to do with position. The birthright of Esau and Jacob, of Isaac, where did it go? To Jacob or to Esau? It went to Esau, but he, what? Sold. Sold it. So it, it was passed to. And so they went, though, to the oldest son. We're dealing with position, and oftentimes people look at this as a lesser than. No, it has to do with position, not power. If you would, look to John chapter 19, verse 10 and 11. John chapter 19, verse 10 and 11. Jesus, now in the courtroom of man with Pilate, is being addressed by Pilate the Roman governor, and in verse 10 says, Then Pilate said to him, Are you not speaking to me? Do you know that I have power to crucify you and power to release you? Jesus answered, You could have no power at all against me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. Notice we're dealing with authority hooked with power. Authority, where did all authority come from? From above. Notice that you could have no power unless it was given from above. So Pilate, boasting in that, I have the power to crucify you or to release you, and Jesus immediately recognizing and knowing and saying and revealing to us, that the power that you have, that you're trying to exercise over me, that power isn't in you. That power is from above. Therefore, the one who submitted me to you, the one who gave me up to you, that's the greater sin. 
Of course, we all know that was Judas. So authority and power, we're seeing that it's all coming from above. Spiritual entities. Turn back now to Matthew chapter 28, the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, excuse me, uh, 28, 18. 28, 18. And Jesus came and spoke to them, meaning the disciples. He's now resurrected, but not has yet ascended. What's he say? Jesus came and spoke to them. What's the thing he says? All authority. How much authority? All. All. Everything, everywhere. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And then he gives us our, the church, therefore, marching orders of what we're to do. What's the first word? Go. Go. Having that go in your heart. Notice in verse 17. And when they saw him, what did they do? They worshipped. Based on our previous discussion, or when they worshipped, what are they recognizing? He has the authority. He has the authority. Anybody who says that they worship God and yet obey that which is not God or of God is not worshiping God. Worship, we have turned today, listen now, we have turned worship today into singing songs. We have turned worship today into singing songs. But I tell you that a person could worship the Lord and never sing one song. But just in the quietness of their heart and the living out of the monotony of the day, be a worshiper of God. Because Jesus himself said, the time is coming and now is that those who worship the Lord will do so in spirit and truth. It didn't say with song and dance. In spirit and in truth. Worship has to do with, they came in worship, they recognized that he's the authority one. He just conquered death. There's no one greater. So, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. He, therefore, if he has all authority, he also, therefore, can give authority to whomever he wills. Amen? Therefore, when we see a person in authority, no matter how they got there, if we look at it and say, we just don't like it, doesn't matter. All authority has been given and he distributes accordingly. How we respond to that authority, remember what we just discussed with Pilate, the greater one is the one who submitted me to you, the one who gave me up to you, then it matters how we respond to that authority, does it not? It does matter how we respond to that authority. Let's go back to the story of Saul and David. King Saul, greatest king of all times. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Right? Anyone who's studied Saul will come to the realization that King Saul was a man about himself. But David always called him what? The, the king, the anointed one. He's anointed king. And always respected him accordingly. Did he not? And the ones who usurped, or the ones who conspired, or the ones who worked against Saul, what did David do to them? Killed them. He himself, who he himself, David is anointed to be the next king. He himself had every justifiable right to take that authority for himself, refused to do so knowing that all authority is given by the God. Refuse to do it, and here you got these young upstarts going and doing it. He kills them. It matters how we respond to authorities in our life then. In order to worship God, and to be a worshiper of God, then it matters how we respond to authority. So when an employer says, I want you to, and then we go and do it our own way, And do it because we think that's the right way to do it. And that's we have decided. We don't discuss it with them. We just call our own shots. Then we're actually opposing the authority that's been placed in our life. You, in our American culture, you have the right to have that job or not have that job. Just if you don't like that authority, you can leave. Just quit. I'm done. You have that right. We're not under a taskmaster's hand that says do it or not. And even you'll notice, and we will address it later on, that the Bible even instructs us that even if there's a master, you're a slave, and a true slave. And there's a master in your life. It says to submit to the master as unto the Lord. And it says, masters, treat your servants as, as God himself, as, as kind. 
That doesn't mean they all, all will, and that doesn't mean they're all saved. But he's talking to the church. So it matters then how we respect authority. The Old Testament says that when a child is rebellious and defying the authority of the parents, what are we supposed to do with that child? Do you know what it says in the Old Testament? Under the old laws, under the Mosaic Covenant, take them out of the camp and stone them. So, how oh, we're going to have a different church service this Sunday. <laughs> It'll be out back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, bring all your family members. <laughs> We're going to clean house. <laughs> so, but that's the importance. It's not to carry out that law but in that way, but rather the importance of understanding to worship God involves the authorities in our life. That who you have placed as an authority in your life who has been placed as an authority in your life by default. You had nothing to do with it. Parents. You had no choice over that. Well, you don't know. I had the most lousy parent who ever could. No matter what, that is the parent who brought you into a state of awareness. And at least be grateful for that. Because without that, you would not even have the awareness that you're alive. You've been brought into being. You're a human being. And in that, give thanks for that and move on. So, in this, we need to recognize that there are certain authorities that we have submitted to, and there are certain authorities that have been placed over us. There are certain authorities in place that we can do nothing about, some that we can. But in it all, this is the key. To worship God and to worship God appropriately in spirit and in truth always involves authority. You cannot get out of it. And anyone who is always bucking authority, getting in the face of, trying to fix it, trying to control it, trying to get it to come under their dominion, they are not a, a, a person in worship of God. They are trying to instead do what the devil did, come under me. That's the devil's work. It's the devilish spirit. Is that making sense? When somebody is working in such a way to try to get someone else under them in that manner, trying to get the one in authority to come under, to abide by, to control, it's the devil's work. It is divisive. It always leads to trouble. Bubbles up trouble all the time. So, now in this, let's turn to look at what the Holy Spirit does in John chapter 16. I know we're flipping back now to John chapter 16. You'll notice that in various discussions that we've had, personal discussions, maybe a counseling session, various preaching times, praying for you at the altar, one of the things that I stress to you on a regular basis has to do with authority. Is that not so? Authority. Coming against, understanding authority in your life, uh, because we cannot truly worship God or be a worshiper of God, and I know that's what you want. As a new creation in Christ, that's what you want. But to get to the point where you are uh, submissive, Oftentimes, people have painted submissiveness as being docile. And that's not true. That being submissive means that you respect and give regard to that one's authority, just as David did to Saul. David was the last person I'd call docile. Right? <laughs> he certainly wasn't docile. But yet, was in full submission to the authority of the king. But he didn't carry out every order that he told him to do. But he respected always that that's the authority. I'm not king, he's king. And God can make me king anytime he wants. Okay? John chapter 16, verse 14. Jesus now, speaking of the Holy Spirit who's about to come. What's the first word how Jesus describes the Holy Spirit? He. 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 There's a personal personhood attached there. Remember we talked about the person of the Holy Spirit? It's not an it. It's not a force. It's not this outside being out there. It's a very personal being. He's called the other comforter, the helper. Very personal. It says, he will, he will, what's he going to do? Glorify who? Christ, me. He's going to glorify me. He's going to glorify Jesus. Notice what he's going to do. For he will take of what is, he will take of what is mine. And he's going to do what? 
and declare it to you. Notice how the Holy Spirit is going to take what belongs to the Lord. He's going to take the Lord's, what, has been, what he's earned, that he's captured death, he's gained the victory, he's now got all authority, he's going to take what's mine, and what's he going to do with it? Declare it to you, us. That's the Holy Spirit's going to be doing. He's going to be exercising the authority that Jesus gained. Does that make sense? The Holy Spirit is going to take what is the Lord's and declare it to you and I. Now, he's not just declaring it just for the sake of declaring it. He's declaring it to glorify Christ Jesus. And if he's declaring it to us, where does he want Christ glorified? In us and among us. He's going to take what's mine. All authority has been given to me, Jesus said. He's going to take what's mine and he's going to declare it to you. That we would understand if Jesus has all authority, all authority, not one thing rises or falls. Not, think of it now. And I know this may sound, this may sound far-fetched, but it's not. Not one, uh, Mitch, not one buck can overcome another buck without the Lord's, okay, out in that field. All authority has been given. Not one man can overcome another man. Not one man can come into a position of authority. Not one thing can happen. Not one dog becomes alpha dog unless the Lord, he's in charge of all things. I know that may sound far-fetched because we've been fed so often the idea that natural world just goes on by its own. But not one sparrow falls to the ground without his knowledge of it. Nothing happens. Nothing comes your way. Nothing takes place. That's the security of it all. There's no happenstance. There's no chance of. There's no go with the roll of the dice. He's in charge of all things. That's why when we call upon him in the midst of bleakness and impossibility, that we can look to him and say, all authority has been given unto you and nothing comes my way or this way or any way unless you have said, okay. Meaning you've got a purpose for it and I want to be involved in that purpose. I want to know what's going on. You're either revealing something, you're proving something, you're judging something, you're allowing us, you know, we look and say, well, how can, the, how can he's letting the country, he's proving the wickedness of our own heart that refused to turn to the Lord. And we see all these things. He's working out something in your family, in your life, to put steel in, your, in backbone in, your, in our faith. He's doing something to, put us, uh, to give us a mouth for the Lord. He's doing something in our lives to challenge us, to bring blessing, to move next step, to whatever the case may be, to free us. But remember all this, he says, I have good thoughts towards you. A prevailing thought should always be that nothing happens without your say-so. Nothing happens without your knowledge. Nothing takes place. Not, not even a dog can become top dog unless you are. Nothing comes. Therefore, I'm going to turn to the one who has all authority. That's the key. I'm going to turn, therefore, to the... Matter of fact, I'm going to turn to and submit to your authority rather than anybody else's authority because all authority comes from you. Therefore, I'm going to submit to your authority, only your authority. I'm going to not listen to any other authority, but I will yield to their authority you've placed over me only as unto the Lord, knowing that it comes all from you. Hence, I'm a worshiper of God. Does that make sense? Now I'm a worshiper of God because I'm not going to yield and fear and cower and pull away and retreat from the things of God because I'm going to stead in my time of distress. What will I do? I don't know. What will I do? I'm going to call upon the Lord. In the day of distress, I will call upon the Lord. In the day of blessing, I will praise the Lord. But no matter what, whether I live or die, I'm going to praise the Lord. Because I'm a worshiper of God. Because I'm going to yield. I recognize and give regard to his authority first and foremost in my life. Because I'm a worshiper of God. That's the key of understanding. The Holy Spirit comes and has taken what is and has declared it to us. And he's glorifying Christ in our lives. Look at the verse before that. Verse 13. However, when he, the spirit of Truth. Now, you are well aware of this, but truth, truth is unbending. True? Either that's true or it's a lie. 
You can't have like a little bit of truth or a little bit of, it's, either, it's true or it's not true. Truth is like mathematics. That the equation needs to be all true in order for it to work. Or else it's false. You can't have 1 plus 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 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1, plus one and equal in total a different number than what they add up to. And say, yeah, but at least most of it's right. It, it's, it's wrong. It's false. And that's the devil's plan, is to always sprinkle in the lie with just an element of truth to make the person hone in and say, yeah, but it's got a, like, it sounds true. That's right. That sounds like. But in actuality. So in this, he's the spirit of truth. However, verse 13, when he, the spirit of truth, unbending truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. What is Jesus? Jesus in talking, Pilate asked him, what is truth? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth. Right? In all this, we ought to, he asked, what is truth? Jesus is right there. When he was asked about, when, uh, at the time of Lazarus, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is the truth, the spirit of truth. Remember what it says? He will take what it's mine, authority. He will take what it's mine, truth. He will take Christ and declare it to you. But it says, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority. But whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. This doesn't mean that he's less than God. This is positional. It's positional. All authority has been given to Christ. Therefore, if, if the Holy Spirit was speaking in his own authority, he'd be a usurper. But instead, he speaks what he's taken from the Lord. Speaks that authority, speaks that truth, not in his own, but he submits to the other. It's an act of submission, recognizing the one who came and died for us. Does that make sense? So take this now to ourselves. What are we also therefore called to do? We are called to submit to the truth and to become declarers of truth, submit to authority, and to proclaim authority, we're not here for our own glory. We're here to glorify Christ. Christ, God Almighty, Holy Spirit in us, we're doing the same things. Therefore, what I don't speak on my own authority, so even standing before you today, I don't speak in my own authority, but rather, it's the authority of Christ speaking. I speak His words. They're words that I hear to speak. So that's where the power lies, is in His authority. We're just the stand-in. So that he will speak. For whatever he speaks, he will speak, and he will tell you of the things to come. Now, in this truth, unforgiving, it is the Holy Spirit. That is, he's going to take the authority, he's going to take the words, he's going to take the work of Christ, the truth, and he's proclaiming it and declaring it and teaching us, and it says even guiding us in these things, even of things to come. Lastly, and this is the most important one of this section. And we'll end it on this last verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Building off of all of this, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 17. This is the one that we've got to catch. It is oftentimes missed, but we've got to catch. 3.17. Now I, I know that this is... When we're dealing with worship and authority and Christ and the Holy Spirit and governance and control, and this can become deep stuff to, to process, but boy, if we can get this, you become a true worshiper of God and you start spotting it in others where the error is and where the devil's uh, even working his ploy, trying to you stir up or you conspire or to gain attention or authority or speaking out of his own words. What's it say in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17, looking at it together? It says, Now the... The Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So, for you and I as the church, remember now what we just read in John. He will take what's mine and declare it to you. Remember, truth. We already know that Christ is truth. He's not speaking on his own. It says here, now the Lord, who's the Lord? If I was to say at any time saying, who's the Lord? And the answer is Jesus. But what's it say here? The Lord is the Spirit. 
what is it, contradicting? Or rather, is it building off of John chapter 16? He will take what is mine and declare it to you. He will declare the truth. He will guide you in all things. And in this, for you and I and who Christ is in us, if I was to say, who lives in you? Christ Jesus. Yet, there's another answer, isn't there? The Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit in us is the the Spirit of the Lord. So if I said, so the Holy Spirit in you is, right, so the, the Spirit is the Lord of your life. And He is there speaking what to you? Truth. And the truth is Christ. Savior. In you. So this is what has taken place in our lives. The Holy Spirit in you. And what will the Holy Spirit do? The same thing He's doing. Which is He's submitting to Jesus. He's, submission, he's in submission to the Lord and to the Father. Just as Jesus submitted to the Father, just as the Father gave all authority to Jesus, the Holy Spirit is in submission to, you can't get away, if it's good for God Almighty for submission to His authority and His position, then what would He also want us to do? Submit. And we look at it as such a bad word because everyone tries to portray it and see it as docile and weak when in actuality it's the very strength of God. It's the very personhood of God. It's the very aspect of who God is in our life. It's to call for submission. Therefore we submit to also who He is in our lives and we submit to what He's doing in our lives and we submit to the position He's given into our lives. Joseph was raised up out of the prison house and set at the right hand of Pharaoh, yes? As a type for the work of Christ. Joseph then had to submit to the authority that was given to him. To not exercise the authority given to him would have been instead to exercise the authority that how he sees it. Gee, I know Pharaoh that you've said, but I would rather... Gee, people will think I'm... Oh, so now you're going by according to what man's saying and seeing... You don't want them to see you, so you're going to give regard more to man than to Pharaoh. Do you see the difference? We are called to exercise the authority of the position that God has made us. If you're the head of a home, then you should be acting as the godly head of a home. As an employer, who want, have you ever worked for an employer who can't make a decision? Pretty tough. Isn't it tough? Try to work for an employer who's hired you, or you're under a manager who can't make a decision. Gee, I don't want to offend that department, and if they say that, and that one's going to say, and I don't know what to do, what do you think? And no matter what you say, yeah, but I don't, yeah, I don't. The, the philosophy and theology of yeah, but. You know, yeah, but. It's, isn't it frustrating, and nothing ever gets done, and it always gets caught, and we're trying to have all kinds of meetings because we're trying to, instead of just, you've been given that authority, gain some advice, the wisdom of the elders, and then what? Make a decision. Move forward. So, we are called to exercise those as parents, as heads of homes, as employers, as pastor. Can you imagine, as pastor, never able to come quite as to a decision as to, yeah, but this side, this side has more people on it this time than this side. And so, what do you guys think? Let's take a vote. Well, they want, you know, and if I go with you guys, they're going to get upset. And if we do that, now we become no longer exercising the authority of Christ in us, on the position of, but rather yielding to the, the face of clay, the voice of man. Can't do that. Can't exercise that. Can't operate that way. Now, if also the, a person starts going out and exercising their own authority and speaking out of their own words, now that's also an issue, isn't it? Because you don't see that as what we just addressed. You don't see God himself doing that. Therefore, we are also to do as he is doing. We work in harmony with His Spirit because His Spirit is in us and the Lord is the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And if you want to be, and we want to be a true worshiper of God, we worship in spirit and in truth, yielding to the One. We give regard to Him alone. 
All authority has been given to him. We submit to that authority and we don't yield to that devil's voice who's trying to get us to yield to some other voice, some other demand, some other, you'd better or I'm going to get mad at you. Well, then get mad. That's Because if you have two options, is that either you submit and we get in harmony and go or you want to get mad and well, then that's your, that's your decision. But I'm not going to try to control that, but this is where we're going. Think of families, think of employers, think of... It's, think of the United States, that is, is that is if we are the United States, but notice how we're starting to just see a, 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 a ra- an unraveling, as people are all rising up and wanting their own way. No longer for the good of the country as a whole, but instead I want personal rights, personal favor. I want this candidate because he's going to give me what I want. Therefore, it's all becoming this personal effect. Churches, obviously, are, are uh, sadly running much this way. Everybody comes to church and what they want. What do you have to offer? Come to church. How many phone calls and emails I get? What do you have to offer? I've got three children. I've got one child. I'm older. What have you got to offer me? i got the love of the body. Yeah, but that's, I'm looking for, what programs, what events, do you put together Mount Washington cruises, do you, you know, do you, you know, do you on Sunday morning, you know, have a guitar with a harmonica and a silly hat just because I'm looking for a little entertainment, you know, it's, what are you, what are you offering me, I've got to have the, the children's programs, the senior adults, do you have parking out front for everybody that, because I'm a little, uh, I, I got my blue sticker, I've got to make sure I, and that's what they're looking for is what? It's a me type of church situation. It's, it's gotten into the church. And that's not the body of Christ. I'm youth. I'm child. I'm senior. I'm married. I'm single. I've got to have this. I've got to have that. I do. Christ isn't enough anymore. That's not the Holy Spirit. It's not the Spirit of the Lord. It's just not. Those who worship God, where do we, how do we begin and how do we end it has to do with authority. And has to do with submission of authority, has with truth prevailing in the inward parts of who we are, has to do with the spirit man coming alive, those who worship God worship in spirit and truth. And as we just read, the spirit of the Lord in us, yielding to his authority and giving him regard, knowing that every other authority that's ever been put in place has been happened and done so only because he has allowed it. And coming across our lives, whether it happened by default or whether it happened by a choice that we made, no matter what, even when my son uh, Adam bought that that building that uh, has really done him in. And I said, Adam, God could have stopped that at any time before you signed. But in it, he wants, therefore, he, this was about two years ago. I says, therefore, he's in it and wants to teach you something through it. Now let's go to work. So it comes down to, it would have been nice to just console and sympathize and cry with and woe is me and how could God and, but nothing happens. Brain surgery, Adam, I don't know why, I don't know how, but I know this. We've got to trust him. I'm, and now he's, he's in. Now it's no longer me encouraging him. Now he's there. It's he's there. Because we have to trust and say, Lord, and that's why we call upon you, Lord. Prayer nights, we get together. Why? Calling upon the Lord. Who else are we going to call to? The other authorities in our life, they only have authority because of him. Now we can go and get counsel, and buy, we have to. Counsel and advice and wisdom and people have, but you're always looking for what? The word of the Lord, the guidance of the Lord, looking for truth, looking for what God is doing in our lives. Amen? Amen. 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 So let's become true worshipers of God in Jesus' name. Therefore, we just stand before the King and the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Not just the King, but the King of kings. Not just the Lord, but the Lord of lords. Not just before Lord God Almighty, but the God of gods. We're standing before him and recognize right now that full authority is in his hands. And the Holy Spirit has come into our lives. And we're going to obey the Lord because the Lord is the Spirit. You are the Lord. And he's not going to come and say, well, I'm the Lord. You better listen to me. No, because he's here to glorify Christ. You'll hear it bearing witness in your heart. Christ Jesus is Lord. That's him. Because no one can say Christ Jesus is Lord except by the Spirit of God. So in this, Jesus, you are Lord. No one comes to the Father except through you. All authority has been given to you because you're the one who conquered death. 
You laid your life down and you had the power to take it back up. You're God and there is no other. So we shall not walk in distress, though distressing times may come. Because we're going to learn the lesson of the psalmist and call out to Jesus. We're not going to give ourselves over to the voice of man or give regard to the face of clay. Except, Lord, as unto you. Because you are God and there is no other. We're going to submit to you. I pray for your power, your glory, your truth, your might to be in each and every person in this room in Jesus' name. To live for God. Lord, that we would submit to you and you alone. Let this church be known. And let it go forth, Lord, throughout all of these towns and communities and even the state and even New England. And Lord, if you see so fit, even to all New England, all the world, all this nation, all the world, that this is a church of spirit and truth. Where true worshipers recognize and live in accordance with the authority of Jesus Christ. Because, Lord, devils cower at the name of the Lord. But in the name of the Lord, we can rise up with all boldness. We can enter into your throne room of grace because we recognize that we belong to you. We can come into the throne room of God and say, Abba, Father. Because Jesus has prepared the way and your spirit is bearing witness to our spirit that we belong to him. So Lord, I pray for your blessing on each person in this room and their respective families that we would walk in the authority of Christ Jesus, that we would recognize the governance of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And as we proceed with these lesson plans, Lord, I pray that more revelation would come forth in their lives. They would recognize the authority that we have in you, but it's not our own authority. It's you. That is, we're not speaking our own words, more demanding and commanding according to our own wills, but by the will of the Father. Let your blessing be in this room and in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. amen. Praise God. Enjoy one another's company and walk in the authority of Christ in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. Praise God.